Hello everyone, the day is Thursday, July 2nd, 2020, and this is the week in charts. I'm just going to thank all you guys and girls for coming this week. Looks like more and more people are getting here, even though I seem to do a good job of hiding the show from everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously. I'm going to have a lot to say about that in both the slides and the live charts, but more so, I guess, I guess, in the live charts. We'll take a look at the sectors and everything else. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, just so my ADD does not kick in, keep them to the slides. And then when we open it up for our live charts, feel free to ask about anything you want. Also, your favorite stock picks, put them in, put them in one at a time, but wait until we get to the live charts, just so I don't get them mixed up with the questions. And also, by putting them in one at a time, I'll be able to know whether I covered them or not. So I want to follow up a little bit on Holy Grail days. That's something we talked about last week. And Anytime I go down that volatility rabbit hole, it's pretty hard for me to come out of it because it, it could be a holy grail or it sure seems like a holy grail. In fact, we're going to talk about finding these holy grail days. And I don't think I have anything magical here, but I do think just kind of thinking about things a little bit outside the box, such as, OK, it's been a while since we've had a holy grail day or we do. And then that plus all the other things we talked about last week, which I'll recap again this week, makes will make a lot of sense and maybe help us know when a Holy Grail day is due. And I learned a lot in the process from all this, and I'm going to give you some little tips and tidbits in a few minutes on all this too. I want to stick with this simple stuff to stay with trend and something I've messed with lately. And for a while, I thought I might have had a new Holy Grail, but then it came to my senses, but it's still something that's pretty cool, I have to admit, and I'll, that'll make sense in just one second. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, borrowing a line from my friend Greg Morris, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. On my website, I've been having these bear market updates. I might just have to change the bear to bull, which I did in my newsletter, and then the market sold off hard <laughs> the next day. But so far, so good, and we'll flesh all that out in just a minute. Now, before we get to this little trend following indicator, so to speak, I worked on a mid-year update for stock charts, and I, I guess I didn't read the email carefully. It's going to air next week, and I know I told a couple of you guys to go in and watch it because it would it should have aired yesterday. I thought it should have aired yesterday, but they're going to do all the mid-year updates next week. So keep an eye out for that over at stockcharts.com. And I'll post it to my website the second it is published on YouTube. So keep an eye just on my website and you'll know. And I might even put a, a notification update so you'll get that too. Anyway, one thing that came out of my presentation was that trend following is not perfect, but it's pretty damn cool. And a little bit of a spoiler alert, the full show's next week. I'm going to show you some a couple of little highlights from that. Obviously, we came into this year and we were heavily long. We did have a couple of shorts left over. Now, this is in the model portfolio, which you could keep an eye on at www.davelander.com slash archives. Or if you're on the service, just click on the archives link on the page. So for my mid-year update, I wanted to look backwards and see what was happening or what had happened, I should say, say, and then look ahead for the next six months. So I went to the peak of the market. I think it was on February 19th when the market made all-time highs. And in the model portfolio, we had eight longs and two shorts. We had open profits, and some of those open profits were swing trade profits that have been already been taken, but I do track both of those. And that'll make sense when you watch next week's presentation. But anyway, long story endless, I had eight longs and two shorts on in the model. And then that was on that day there, February 19th. And on the following day, the market sold off a little bit, but it didn't, wasn't that big of a deal. It just looks like a little bit of a pullback. And ironically, I got knocked out of one of my shorts, which 
later would piss me off because it went on to drop about 30 percent and then as you can see as the market dropped we got knocked out of more and more and more of our longs but notice that the amount of shorts began to increase until we had zero longs and all shorts and as the market began to rise all of a sudden what happened well we started getting stopped out of shorts and we started adding in longs. Now, I thought it would be kind of cool. I know you probably want to party with me, right? If I would plot that best I could, the number of longs versus number of shorts. And all I did here was subtract the shorts from the longs for net number. So if we had eight longs and two shorts, the number would be six if we had eight longs and one short eight minus one the number would be seven seven longs and then if you look towards the bottom towards the peak the, the trough you see we had zero longs and three shorts so zero minus three gives you a minus three and i think at the low we had five shorts in the portfolio and if you get really bored go in and watch next week's presentation on that and like i said i think it's i think it's pretty cool now one thing that came out of this and this isn't perfectly aligned but it's it's close enough for government work one thing i thought was awesome is and this is by complete accident but by plotting the shorts versus longs being a short is minus one again and long is plus one you could see that this as this line drops, it means we have less shorts. I'm sorry, as this line drops, we have less longs and more shorts. And as the line rises, we have less shorts and more longs. Now, what I thought was kind of cool about it is it sort of mimics the market behavior, which I thought was really, really awesome. So, you can see up here at the peak of the market, we have an S ton of longs on, okay? And then down here, we have quite a few shorts on, but notice that the amount of shorts peaked out, the number of shorts in the portfolio, after the market bottom. Now, why is this? Well, it's a pullback methodology so in order to put on new shorts the market would have to pull back as a general statement so individual issues are pulling back okay and the other thing to think about is i think the more important concept is with trend following in order to follow a trend you must first have a trend to follow so there's going to be some lag and then notice that this market had rallied significantly and then you could see the net long positions longs minus shorts was a little slow to catch up, but that's okay. That's trend following, like the hokey pokey, that's what it's all about. You have to be willing to live, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I think about it quite often too, is that you have to be willing to live with the nuances of your methodology. Take the good with the bad. Now, trend following, you're going to be a little late to the party. Because again, and I think Greg Morris is one of the first persons I I guess I heard say this, but it's 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 an age old saying. In order to follow a trend, you must first have a trend to follow. I know I just said that, but but it makes a lot of sense. So if the market is going down, it's gonna have to start going up for a while before you'll start getting some long side setups now every now and then and i know i beat the dead horse on this but it was just such a cool thing at the time i can't not talk about it double negative there i think but in 2007 coming into around october or so the market was making gradual all-time highs based on the s p 500 and i couldn't find a long setup to save my life all i could find was shorts and then as I've said quite a bit, I apologize to my clients for recommending all these short side setups. And I had no idea the market was going to roll over. 
And it did, obviously, in a pretty big way. And we were 100% short by the time the market rolled over. It'd be fun to go in and look at those archives and see if what I'm saying is true. And then also how to, it'd be also fun to, I should say, plot this little graph to see how it looks relative to the overall market. And this line might actually be skewed a little bit more and it might have actually led the market a little bit. Now, why did it do that? Well, because in 2007, there was this internal degradation of stocks. And what do we do? We listen to the database. And listening to the database, the database was saying, hey, I don't have any long side setups, but I have all these shorts. What do you want to do? And it's like, well, I guess I don't have a choice. I guess I have to take some of these short side setups. I don't like fighting the overall market, but you know, let's just put on a short or two and see what happens. And then all of a sudden, short or two became two or three and so on and so forth. This time, though, it was a little bit more out of the blue. There was not that internal degradation. All of a sudden, the shit just got to hit the fan, right? All of a sudden, coronavirus became a big deal, obviously, and the market began to implode. So it did take a little while to catch up. Also notice, when the market implodes like this, let me just draw in one more thing, and again, I don't want to give you all next week's show, so you have something to watch next week, something to do, right? But if you look at the, the slide in the market, and again, in order to follow a trend, you must first have a trend to follow. So we had this gap here, but that could have just been one really bad day. And then we had this really bad day. It's like, okay, it could be deteriorating and the market continued to implode. Well, with my system, until you get a pullback, which you did right here, you're not going to see any shorts setting up. So a lot of this slide here was longs getting knocked out. And then all of a sudden you started adding shorts and adding shorts as the market began to slide. And then the reason that the shorts continues to increase down here is because as the market pulled back, you're still adding shorts on down here. Now you had a little bit of a lag. So again, in 2007, we were lucky in that the database said, hey, something, something's wrong. Something's wrong, and I hate to use the word fundamentally, but fundamentally with the market. And that probably was because smart money was saying, you know, there's a lot of liquidity in this system and all the things that, the that uh, what's his name, Barry pointed out in the big short, which if you haven't seen, I'd recommend you watch it. So somehow the market knew about that and it was easily seen just by running your scans every night or looking at your tradable universe and seeing all the short setting up. This slide here was caught us all a little bit out of the blue and it just, it happens. And if you're a trend follower, it comes with the territory and you just have to live with it. But anyway, I just thought this was kind of cool. A little lag in there, but lag is, lag is an okay thing, I think, when it comes to trend following. So again, right around the peak, we had seven. We were net minus five, and I know we didn't have any longs, so that's all shorts and no longs. And then now we have five longs in the portfolio. We might have an extra one in there. I don't know if anything triggered since I made this slide, but five or six longs in the portfolio. Now, a little bit more of a spoiler alert here, but so what do we learn from all this? And if you go, back and watch, or when you get to see the entire show, it'll make a lot more sense. Well, one thing I thought about is that if you can't be in the trend you love, you need to love the trend you're in. Short side's a pain in the ass, make no bones about it. But if that's all the market is producing, we are traders and how do we get paid? We get paid to trade, okay? So be willing to take those short side setups. Believe in what you see and not in what you believe. I was probably bearish for a little longer than I should have been, okay? because I'm a bit of a germaphobe and I saw the whole world coming unglued and I figured that this coronavirus is the real deal. It might still be, who knows, okay? Seems to change every single day. But the bottom line is believe in what you see and not in what you believe. And somebody emailed me and said, Dave, you are so bearish. Now you're getting bullish. What's going on? It's like, well, the market's going up. You know, it's like, it is what it is. I can't believe it's going up. But it is. And a lot of hedge fund managers, and I think one guy went on a rant on CNBC. I just saw it on the viral thing on, on the net. But a lot of these hedge fund managers confuse the issue with facts 
and couldn't believe the market was going up. Well, that's where being a trend following moron really helps. And I was probably still bearish putting on those long side setups. And it was hard for me, but sometimes you have to do the hard thing. I was actually going to write a column called Do the Hard Thing, but I'll just give you the whole column in a nutshell now. If you're getting long side setups and no short side setups or a few short side setups, then you should be trading the long side. Maybe the database is speaking once again. So it was hard, but I began buying stocks in face of all this uncertainty. And these smarter people, these hedge fund managers, could not believe the market was going up. Probably the most liberating thing that ever happened in my career, and I, and I have a story I wrote on it, which I think is pretty damn good, I say so myself. And I'm, I'll make that public at some point in time, but I'm not ready yet. But was becoming a trend following moron. And that just freaking liberated me from trying to outsmart the market and just follow along. So trust in your database, as I just said, you get a lot of shorts, you want a short, you get a lot of longs, you want to go long. If you can't find a setup to save your life, you want to sit on your hands. And sitting on your hands is one of the most important parts of trading, if not the most important part of trading. If you don't put capital into harm's way, when you shouldn't be putting capital into harm's way, then you're gonna have lots of capital for when you have opportunities. And guess what? You're also going to have, this is something else I've been writing about a lot lately too. You're also going to have mental capital, if that makes sense. Let's say you're trying to grind it out, trying to grind it out, losing your ass, losing your ass, losing your ass, day after day after day. And then finally, some great opportunities come along. Mentally, you're going to be worn out and you're not going to be able to take those next opportunities. Another thing I've been thinking about a lot, and it's probably inspired by What's the creative Dilbert's name? He wrote a book, How to Fail at Everything and Still Do Okay or whatever. <laughs> it was a pretty good book. Let me see if I have it here. Well, I forget the name of it, but if you go on the back end of the website, if you go to the members area and look at the now columns, I've talked about it before. But he talks a little bit about doing things work-wise that give you energy versus take energy away. And, I, and it really struck a chord with me and really our job, a big part of our job as traders is to manage our energy. And if we are worn out by the time the opportunities finally come along, and sometimes they could be few and far between, then we're not gonna be in the right mindset to take them. So I haven't fleshed this out completely, but I definitely think there's a mental capital involved too. And then if you're patient and wait and wait and wait and wait, then you're ready to pounce. Now, one thing, again, not to give you a spoiler alert, but a lot of things came out of this as I put together the spreadsheets and walked through all the trades and everything. And one was that in trend following, you give up a lot of open profits. And as a trend follower, you're going to spend a lot of your time less wealthy. Lately, I've been grinding it out, grinding it out, grinding it out, not making a whole lot of money. And today, knock on wood so far, it's been a pretty damn good day, better than the last five or six days combined. And it just comes with the territory. And the story I often tell along the lines of trend following and momentum is like I asked Mike Moody, who was giving a presentation on momentum once, and I was like, Mike, momentum always ends badly. What's your take on that? Because if I could ever solve for the fact that momentum ends badly, you would never see my fat ass again. And, and again, let's not forget, the only way to ever make money is to capture a trend by trading trends or trading momentum, right? And Mike Moody's kind of laid back and he's like, Dave, if you're gonna have a baby, you're gonna have a lot of baby poop. Babies are kind of cool and kind of neat and I've had a couple of kids myself, and but they come with a lot of baby poop. So you're gonna have to be willing to be less wealthy for extended periods of time as a trend follower and then bam market takes off and you absolutely print money now managing your mental state doing all this easier said than done but it can be done the other thing i was thinking about quite a bit is just let the ebb and flow control your portfolio a lot of people are like dave dave let's just get out of the market it, it doesn't look good it's like well you never know when that one stock will take off and we had those two shorts in the portfolio that were left over from way 
last fall, way back last fall. And unfortunately, one stopped out right before the market rolled over. It happens, spell it SH. But the other one paid off really, really nicely. I think it went down, and by the time it stopped out, it was a 45% profit, better than a polk in the eye. And that's why I don't rush out and exit my longs, even though things get a little iffy. Even though I know in hindsight, I'm going to be kicking myself in the ass for not doing that. But you know what? Hindsight is 2020. And one more thing, too, as far as giving up open profits. Lately, I've been fielding some emails from some of you guys that are a little bit newer to my methodology, not new to trading, but newer to the way I trend follow and manage the money through the money management, the 2% risk, the taking initial profits, and so on and so forth. And you're having trouble having that much risk out there. Well, first of all, just trade at a smaller size until you get comfortable with the risk and slowly get your risk up to that 2% number, okay? Go in and watch the money man management module under the learning area for a lot more on that. But you have to be willing to lose money in order to make money. You don't want to lose money and you have to make sure you have the best of the best of the best stocks going in. And I work really hard to do that every day. And then you just let the chips fall where they may. And somebody asked me a few days ago, I think it was QTT. Hey, Dave, should I get out of QTT? It's not really doing anything. You had talked about that, remember, last week in the Landry List. I'm like, yeah, I know it. I'm long that stock. Well, today, after being underwater and slightly profitable and underwater for a week or so, all of a sudden it finally takes off, okay? So if you were scared, for lack of a better word, to lose money on the trade, and guess what? You were you were less wealthy for a whole week on the trade, and now, bam, you're more wealthy, but guess what? No, not chicken butt. Guess what? You're gonna probably be a little less wealthy on that trade for a while until and unless it rockets higher again, and that's just what happens. So again, you want to listen to the database. If you got a lot of longs setting up, buy signals, that is, buy. If you got a lot of shorts, short. If you've got neither or not enough to get excited about one side or the other, then sit on your hands. Stops are going to take you out as far as the ebb and flow is works. And that's the whole kind of purpose of drawing that little graph. Like, hey, we got knocked out of longs, but we started making money on the short side, okay? Now, again, I don't want to make it look like we just printed money through this whole freaking cycle. And the reason I'm uh, making the point so much about giving up money is we gave up a boatload of open profits and all those longs, but we started making a boatload of money on the short side. And guess what? We gave up a lot of that those profits on the short side when the market started going up. But what do we do? We started buying stocks again. And if you get bored, Go through every one of these services for this year, and I think that gives you a really good feel. It's kind of like compressed in, right? It would take you 10 years to go through all these cycles, maybe 13 years of war, 14 years to go through all these cycles, uptrend, downtrend, sideways. But this year, we had absolutely everything. And again, you have to take some initial profits along the way if that's what the market's offering. And then we keep that free position just in case we make 50% on the short side or several hundred percent on the long side. So recently, Charlie Kirk plotted the 513 EMA and talked about it. And I was pretty amazed at these crossings with the 5 and 13 EMA. Right at the top of the market, maybe two days afterwards, the five-day EMA crossed below the 13-day EMA. And then look what happened. It stayed below the 13-day EMA for a really, 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 really nice trend lower. And then what happened? Well, it eventually crossed back above it. It had like a little kits in there but then stayed above it for a long, 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 long time. So I kind of went on a holy grail hunt with this five-day, 13-day EMA, and I found some amazing things with it. One thing that kind of amazed me, just as a side note, imagine that, me go off on a tangent, 
is that on a five minute chart, it could do a pretty good job of keeping you on the right side of the trend, FYI. So when I saw this sell signal right at the top and a buy signal not too far off the bottom, I said, wowza, this might be something. This might be something amazing. This might be a holy grail. <laughs> My wife's always like, what are you gonna talk about? Not the holy grail, huh? I'm like, oh. <laughs> now, we did have, there was a little whipsaw in this thing, as there is with everything. But overall, I can live with a little whipsaw. So this is kind of a pretty cool little deal, right? Just sell when the five EMA crosses below the 13 EMA and buy when the five EMA crosses above the 13 EMA. Now, a few days ago, I was thinking, man, this thing is awesome, but oh no, we have a sell signal after such a good run. So I got to thinking, and I actually started using the 30-day EMA when I first learned about this from Charlie Kirk. And this this has actually been around forever, FYI. I, I hate to use the word, but I think the Fibonacci people like them because they're Fibonacci numbers. But whatever. Anyway, so I got to thinking, let's throw that 30-day EMA in there. And the 30-day EMA looks like it does a pretty good job of keeping you on the right side of the trend as a bit of a longer-term trend filter. Okay. The orange line is a 30-day EMA. And notice that the market mostly went down when you had Landry light, especially, meaning that the highs were less than the 30 EMA and mostly went up when the lows were greater than the 30 EMA. So that's known as Landry light. So it's like, well, okay, well, let's go look at that same period of time where that 513 did so well. And let's just take a look at Landry light. Okay. If you're looking for this Landry light indicator, it is part of Metastock and it's free with Metastock. If you go to the the button on my home page that says learn how to trade trends properly or something like that. It's scrolled down. I am an affiliate for Metastock. I'm also affiliated, not an employee or not compensated of stockcharts.com. And they've been kind enough to program some of these things that I do in other packages. And I've been playing around and messing with them. So if you are a member of stockcharts.com, you can get this indicator free along with a few other ones. In fact, Next week or week after, I'm going to do a show where I'm going to discuss these indicators in some details, or you can just go in and watch all my YouTubes on the week of charts. But anyway, so what would happen if you considered green, meaning lows are greater than the 30-day EMA is good, Tarzan speak, good, and red being bad. So here we have good, like we talked about last couple of weeks. And then we have red, Tarzan speak, bad. And then, of course, it turned green again back in late April. And so far, it's been mostly green, and we haven't had any red. Now, we have had a few kisses of the moving average, but that's okay. That's just a normal little healthy correction. And the other thing you want to pay attention to is the slope of the moving average. You can see that the slope was mostly positive for the entire run. Now, keep in mind that if a close closes below, if the market closes below an exponential moving average, doesn't matter how long it is, the ex exponential moving average will turn down. And so you can see, if you really zoom in, you can see that the, albeit very slightly, but this day is less than this day. This day in the moving average is less than this day. But for the most part, you can see the slope remains up. Right here, you kind of squint your eyes a little bit, kind of hard to see, but this day in the moving average is less than this day. Why? Well, the close is below the moving average. So that's kind of a cool aspect of the exponential moving averages. So I got to thinking about all this trend stuff. I was like, okay, well, I looked at Landry Light and compared it to the 513, and then I looked at just old, plain old 30-day EMA, 
and compared it to the 513 and Landry Light in the 30 day EMA, I should say. So, what about proper order in my beloved bow ties? 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. Proper order meaning 10 above 20 above 30 for the upside and for the downside, the 10 below the 20 and the 20 below the 30. So, if we just stayed long while the market is green or mostly green meaning that you had up print trend proper order you can see you do pretty good and if you stay short or mostly short or out of the market when you have red then you would do pretty good okay and then if it's yellow for a while maybe just sit on your hands a little bit and wait for it to turn green and that's something i'm just kind of looking at in this chart but i think we've talked about that quite a bit sometimes when the market's in a consolidation one will be over the other now meander back and forth and it's probably a good time to sit on your hands but then of course when it turns green for a while you want to go back to being mostly long so as you can see landry light in the 30-day ema and landry light in the in other moving averages and proper order in the bow ties does a pretty damn good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. By the way, I didn't have time to get it in today, but I think we will have, for those keeping we score, I think, it all depends, but I think we could end up with a TFM 10% buy signal in the S&P 500. Now, let's get back to the 513 sell signal that we recently had with the 5 EMA crossing below the 13 EMA. So there's that recent sell signal as you can see, and it could cross back up. Depends on how weak we close today. Now what's kind of cool is the 30 EMA held along with Landry Light. So remember earlier I said, what about the 30 as a possible trend filter? So you might get concerned if the five goes below the 13 but if that 30 ema holds okay i mean obviously you have to have a stop in mind somewhere but if you just do an overall market analysis and that 30 ema is holding in other words no land of light the downside then maybe the market is okay even though you're getting the short-term sell signal and getting back to the bow ties notice that the bow tie proper order 10 above the 20 10 simple above the 20 exponential and the 20 exponential above the 30 exponential so far remain in uptrend proper order or as buckwheat would say okay based on that indicator of proper order we're still okay as far as the s p 500 is concerned so what have we learned yet again well everything works better with trend i've seen people print money as i've said ad nauseum using arcane methodologies but when the arcane methodology disagrees with the trend these same people end up losing their buttocks so everything works better with trend as buckwheat would say okay Okay, regarding the 513, 30 signal, has anyone calculated the angle of the cross? You know, that's that's a good question, Dakota. The answer is no, to my knowledge. I know that in the past, I've talked a lot about bow tie moving averages hitting the 50 SMA, because the 50 SMA has a nice long lag to it, okay? Lag sometimes is bad, but lag can also be good to kind of give you a perspective on things. But when that bow tie moving average begins to implode through that 50 at a sharp angle, you know that the market might be in a lot of trouble. I researched this back through 07, 09, and it looks like the sharper the angle of the cross, the more accurate the signal. I would have to say yes to that, okay? And I think you're onto something, Dakota. So let's take a look at that. So what he's saying is you've got one moving average doing this and the other moving average on top of it, okay? And then he's talking about a sharp cross through them. And then I guess he's adding a 30 in. 
So the bigger the angle of this, reminds me of a little eighth grade rhyme, <laughs> but the bigger the angle, the sharper the inflection point, okay, the the more significant the signal. Yeah, because absolutely, because you have some momentum. When it crosses sharply, you know you have that momentum. Just like the bow ties, let's say you got the 50-day moving average kind of meandering higher, and then all of a sudden you've got a bow tie that just comes straight down through it, maybe like this, then that's a better signal than possibly one that's just kind of slowly forming. Now, I would not ignore this one that's slowly forming at all-time highs, okay? And that's kind of the designer's intent of the bow tie is to catch these more gradual moves. What happens when the when market begins to implode and way down here or whatever, is this forces the bow tie to happen. That's what I call a forced bow tie as opposed to a gradual one. But yeah, this means the market's in a lot of trouble. Just like recently when we imploded from the highs, the uh, the 513, of course, crossed long before we, we dropped significantly. But what was amazing is that we've got a 10% TFM system sell signal, which is a weekly chart sell signal before the bow ties on a daily chart set up and before the first thrust set up and all these other shorter term signals. My guess equals my guess equals sub system here across greater than X percent versus less than X percent. Yeah, messing around with that. My only my only caveat or concern would be don't overcomplicate it too much. You've got these really simple things that give you a good picture as to what's going on, but don't add too many indicators in and don't go overboard, but by all means, noodle with it the best you can and, and try to work on a whipsaw filter. And the other thing too that, that I'm kind of learning as we go through all this is like, okay, that 513 is really, really cool. Well, so is bow ties and everything else because everything was better in trend. But it's but it's okay, and and you know I love my bow ties, and I'm I'm not gonna you could you never you're not gonna get them away from me unless you pry them out of my cold dark cold dead hands. But it is kind of neat to get a little perspective with something like that. And if you do have a sell signal, it's like okay, well we've got a sell signal over here, but let's see what the bow ties are saying. Let's see what the Landry light is saying. Let's see if we're getting a little bit of that confirmation. And then, like what Dakota is saying is, let's see how serious that signal is. Is it just going to go down there and kiss that moving average and barely cross through it, or is it going to go through it like butter? So, yeah, keep noodling with that. If you don't mind, share your findings with us in Facebook, and I'll be happy to throw some pointers your way and maybe figure out ways to help you do a little bit more research on that. On and off for the past couple of months, I've been caught up in a little bit of volatility studies. One of the things I've been working on in more recent times, and, and it's amazing the longer you've been at this business, the more you still continue to learn. And I can think back to hey, the better you get, not that I'm getting better and better and better, but I, I think I'm better than I used to be. But as I've said before, I was very lucky early in my career to work with, and I was helping him find stocks to pick and to trade. But I was able to work with a well-seasoned trader, or a seasoned trader, I should say. And over six to eight weeks, I saw him get better and better and better. And he had been at this for a long, long time. And that's the amazing thing about the markets is you'll never get it completely right. You'll never feel like, oh, I got this. You know, I'm the grand poobah or whatever. But you will get better and better. And there's always something new to learn. And uh, I've been noodling around with this volatility thing. And I started looking for holy grail days. And how can I predict when a Holy Grail day is likely to occur? Now, just to recap, a Holy Grail is when a market starts at one end, doesn't trade much above or below that end, and it ends at the other end on a wide range bar. Now, on 611, and this is the day that haunts me because I lost money on this day, the good news is I went and looked at a bunch of other days before I did all this research. And it looks like I was mostly short on Holy Grail days that went down and mostly long on Holy Grail days that went up. So there is some hope for me. But this is what the market looked like on 611. 
and this is uh, spiders, cash actually made its high on the opening tick and never did get above that tick. And that's one of my lessons learned there. So I call it an HG7, a holy grail day, the widest bar of the last seven, where it starts on one day and ends on the other. Now, here's the deal. The way the programming works and the way markets works work too is that you don't know until after the holy grail day occurs that you have a holy grail day okay so the indicator is in complete hindsight but it shows me when they occur and that's helping me to figure out when they are likely to occur so again the open real close to the high sells off all day it might not be a straight line but when you look at that daily chart at the end of the day anybody ever chase your own tail day trading all day long and then at the end of the day you look at the chart and it looks just like this i know i'm raising my hand i've done it many a times and you realize why did i chase my tail all day why didn't i just get short and stay short put a stop in above that high intraday high and then forget about it but dave i thought you're not a day trader okay well <laughs> get a neighbor uh, guy was working at a neighbor's house. He, he also did the wood in our house. Incredible job. Anyway, <laughs> he was hollering at me over across the porch from the neighbor's house and uh, said something about day trading or something like, should I be day trading? I'm like, no. And my wife goes, he, he day trades more than he admits. Uh, and I do a little bit of day trading, but my ultimate goal with day trading is intraday trading. I want to get in and I want to ride that trend all day long. For instance, right now, I'm short S&P futures and I'm trying not to micromanage myself out. I have stops in place. I'll probably drop an F-bomb because I, because I came fairly close to a profit target and didn't quite hit it. But I'm going to try not to micromanage myself just in case today turns into a holy grail day and I can ride it all day long. And I'm kind of proud of myself when I went back and looked at some recent trades as I was putting together this presentation. And I saw in a lot of cases I'm in like at, and I'm on central time, but I'm in like at nine or 9.30 my time, which is about an hour or so, or, or sometimes even less and the market opens. And a lot of the trades were closed on the close. And that means that I was not in and out all day like the rabbit going for the cocaine, but rather putting on the trades and letting them unfold, good, bad, or indifferent. So again, Holy Grail Day starts at one end, ends at the other, on a wide range bar. Now, knowing exactly when a Holy Grail Day is not possible, okay? But is it possible to know when they are near? So I'll just go through these really, really quick. The Holy Grail Day we just discussed starts at one end, ends at the other. An HG5 is, the, is a bit of a Holy Grail Day where it starts at one end, and rallies or sells off, but it's only a five trading day bar. So it's the highest range of the week. And that's, you can make a lot of money on those days. A narrow range bar means that volatility has begun to compress. If you have four days, I have it marked four, seven to seven, and then 15 with an exclamation point means that that's the narrowest day that we've had in the last three weeks, get ready to get ready. We're going to have a big move in the market. And then a wide range bar is just that. It's the widest range out of the past seven days. Now I'm not looking at average true range, although I am doing some of the average true range research overall, but as far as is looking for these holy grail days, as we discussed today, I am looking at these particular things on the chart. I'm also looking for inside days and then two days within the prior day's range. So that would be an ID one would be inside day. So an ID two would be two days within the range of three days ago, okay? So Monday you have probably a wide range bar day and then Tuesday's an inside day. And then Wednesday might not be an inside day, but it's inside of Monday's range. And hopefully that makes sense. So this is what it looks like on the chart. And as I mentioned a second ago, I am keeping an eye on that average true range to see where we are relative to that, to see if the market is expanding in volatility or contracting in volatility and where that range is. Now, 
we'll come back to that chart in just one second. The question is, what about individual issues? And a buddy of mine, a few days ago, he's a bit of a scalper and he likes to scalp and he's good at it. And then he goes off to save lives, trades the first 30 minutes of the day. Well, what I've been working hard on, and, and a lot of this research has been inspired by him, and my thinking is there's got to be a daily filter so he doesn't go in there and try to scalp every single day. And also, is he tripping over the nickels while going for the dollars, going in and scalping a little bit when he could just put on the trades and leave them on? Now, that would be the holy grail, obviously, and that's what I try to do when my intraday trading, I want to stop short of saying day trading. But on this particular day, he told me, he said, hey, Dave, I shorted Facebook and covered within the first, whatever, 10 minutes or five minutes or however long he's in. But then when I pulled the chart, look at this move down. This is like a 20 point move down, which would be a godsend for a day trader, right? So he went in, got a few points, felt pretty good. And, you know, kudos to him for doing that. But could he have rode that trend out a little bit longer? Now, if we go in, nothing's perfect, right? But if you look here, one of the things I thought about, thinking a little bit outside the box, is how long has it been since we had a Holy Grail day? So like 45 days or so, almost 50 days up here since it's happened. Not that it's gonna to happen tomorrow, but you know it's due to happen. And you can see you had a 15 day narrow range and then another 15 day narrow range. You did have a little bit of expansion and volatility here, a little seven day expansion, but then you had an inside day afterwards. So. As a general statement, volatility had begun to compress. So instead of try to scalping, try to scalp, go in and try to hold on a little bit longer. Now, the other thing you might want to think about doing, and this is where we play these opening gap reversals. This isn't a perfect opening gap reversal because it's not that big. But if you have a big one and you have a nice longer term uptrend, maybe trend, this is a little flat here, but let's say you got a real nice uptrend and the market pulls back. And then you have that opening gap reversal. That would be another way to intraday trade, try to catch that move back into the direction of the trend. Sometimes these holy grail days occur, the market will gap lower, and then you have a holy grail day higher. All right, Mike Mike says, good luck on the ES short. If it gets above 3180, it would trigger a five minute cup and handle, targeting today's high of 3157. I'm looking to go on the weekend with a small long futures position based on historical tendency. Futures to be positive with the weekends. Nice thing about futures over the weekend is we can still exit them tomorrow or Sunday. What are the hours tomorrow on Globex? I don't, I actually don't know that. So if you know that, let me know. Yeah, I'm not looking to, I'm not looking to position trade here. I'm I'm all longs. I have all longs on. This is just a short position I saw setting up on a possible bit of an opening gap reversal. And we also had some compression and volatility that's happening. And yeah, I know I could get stopped out and I'm fairly close to being stopped out now. So I'm not too concerned about it. And it's like, you know, that's the thing. It's like, if I could put on a position and it have it not kill me, then I'll take the position. But if I'm gonna stress out and watch a screen all day, then I know, I shouldn't be in that position. Now, as I said again last week, channeling Crable, Larry Williams, who did a lot of opening gap reversal trading, probably popularized it more than anyone. Larry Connors, who borrowed a lot of research from Natenberg and popularized Natenberg's research. And Linda Rasky's done a little bit on her own too. One thing to look at is volatility ratios, something I haven't, didn't show today. Let me see where the ratio is for the S&P. Well, we can look at it one second. Less than 50%, meaning the short term short term volatility is much less than longer term. Inside days, like we just showed, after narrow range bars. The other thing to look at is is a it's a, uh. <laughs> now you got me all worried about my S P position. <laughs> Damn it! Now I'm watching the screen. Oh no, uptick. <laughs> <Bad. laughs> 
Yeah, that's the other thing too. There, uh, here's the other thing. There is normally a bit of an upward bias before a holiday, okay? So I know that's working against me, but I like the position. I like the fact that the market was selling off this morning after faked out higher, and I get stopped out, I get stopped out. And the other thing too, and I don't want to get too cute with all this, but one thing I've been noticing lately is my, if I'm short futures and my portfolio is going down, at least those futures are going the opposite direction as far as profit or loss, okay? Not that I want to get cute and try to hedge, but that would be a fantasy of mine. Dave, your fantasies have changed. But that would be a fantasy of mine to be able to make money on an intraday down day, which would compensate me for the losses that are being created on my open portfolio. Because what? You're going to spend more of your time being less wealthy or no, no, not more of your time. The majority of your time being less wealthy as a trend follower. So Mike is bullish on S&P futures. They trade till 12 central tomorrow. Huh. Great. So much for a day off. <laughs> Uh, again, getting back to the Holy Grail days when you're closing in on one. What mic is that? Is that Mike P or is that another mic? Because Mike P and I usually agree. Uh, net net is relatively unchanged. Oh, it is Mike P. All right. Are you long right now? You're looking to get long. I may go long with you, Preston G's. So again, if the price hasn't changed in a in a while, 31, 38 is what you're looking at. Okay. If the price has to change in a while, then the price is due to change because traders don't agree for long. And then keep an eye on that compression in the range in the ATR. And as I said earlier, when an HG7 hasn't happened in a while. And then once you in, get to a point where it's possible to have a Holy Grail day or Holy Grail day is due, okay? Then you want to kind of watch that range to make sure you have enough range intraday, okay? And pay attention to the prior ranges. So what am I saying here? A couple, I'm saying two, two different things, but let's say your average true range is here, okay? And average true range in the S&P 500, let me see if I have that somewhere, in the spiders, there's only been about five and a half points. So this is five and a half. One thing I've been watching is the intraday range down here. So your just your regular range, okay? And I'm watching that intraday range, and I'm also watching the percentage of this intraday. So what does that mean? Well, if you think a holy grail day is due, and the market is just bouncing around in a choppy little range, okay? It's not perfect, but you might want to hold off on getting bullish or bearish on a breakout. And you also might want to watch the, the prior day's range too, okay? And if this range is setting up, this is a daily bar, and, and what I will do is set an alarm here and set an alarm there for starters. And then let's say the market makes an intraday high, I'll put an alarm there and then makes an intraday low and then rallies off of it, I'll put an alarm there. Just to kind of alert me the fact that the market is beginning to move. And if I don't have a setup while that range is, is forming, then I'll just go about my life, do a webinar or work on some slides or try to catch up on a lot of stuff. How many positions is too many? I added two to my portfolio. So now I have six positions. Profits have been banged out on two of them. Have you ever not taken a really good looking setup because you had on too many positions? Okay, I've answered this quite a bit, Zach. As you pointed out, when you start taking profits, if you take profits on two positions, you open up a slot for another position because you took off half and half, right? So now you have technically another slot for another position. When I have a lot of longs on, if none or just one or two have hit the initial profit target, I start getting a little nervous. And I'm like, holy crap, I could be wrong and I could be wrong big. So the next setup that I see better be the mother of all setups before I take it, okay? 
because I don't want to be wrong even more. So I don't have an exact answer for you. I will keep taking setups as long as the market is providing great setups. So I will pull my horns in a little bit if I'm really long and not hitting those initial profit targets because I feel like maybe I'm long and wrong, okay? All right, you guys are poo-pooing my position here. Y'all probably gonna be right. <laughs> we'll see. It just has to, if it just would have hit my initial profit target, I wouldn't care whether it stopped out. Do you use TLT in conjunction with the SPY? No. Years ago, you used to be able to trade bonds off stocks and stocks off bonds. That intraday technical analysis or intermarket technical analysis worked pretty good and even worked intraday, but not so much anymore. Okay. Now, if we got a big opening gap reversal in bonds, I might go in and play bonds long or short. And this is what I was trying to say earlier. Pay attention to the intraday range developing. So the daily range, you might have your intraday range within the prior day's range. Pay attention to the prior day's highs or lows, okay? And then also pay attention to how big that range is intraday. Yeah, to, uh, George, the intermarket technical analysis only matters when it matters. And the other thing, they can have long lead and lag times. And that's kind of an interesting thing. So yeah, pay attention to bonds and all that other good stuff, but just realize the long lead and lag times make it, makes it impossible, at least in today's day and age, to time off of it. And that's the main question you have to ask yourself. Can you time off of it when you're looking at some sort of anomaly or some sort of uh, occurrence or whatever? Now, as I've said quite a bit, volatility does not predict direction but it does predict an expansion and trend and just knowing an expansion and trend maybe we can capitalize on that so here's an hg day i think this was a recent one notice we had a narrow range 10 day narrow range then we had a 15 day narrow range we had an inside day and then we also set up a little bit of a trading range short-term trading range you can go back all the way to the 16th and see that the trading range was there. Then we had a gap and go, a gap lower and then continued lower. And it was almost an ID2. So that was the last HD2 that we had. Now, how do you trade them? Like I said last week, go in and watch last week's presentation, Ogres, gap and go. This morning I was watching for a gap and go. And I was kind of hoping for a gap and go, I guess, truth be told, because I wanted to be long, I didn't want to be short. But the market came in and I ended up short. So it ended up being an ogre, opening gap reversal. Intraday pullbacks, use your favorite indicators for that. Bow ties, the, the five and 13 is kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, a pullback of the five to the 13. And then maybe use like a 30 EMA as a trailing stop. Maybe give it a little wiggle room below that to try to hold on all day. And as I've said quite a bit, watch the prior ranges to make sure that if you're just staring at a little tiny chart, okay, each little zig and zag is gonna look huge. I mean, if I if I put the if I move my mic over to my other computer where my SP position is and I reacted to every zig and zag, I would probably sound like a lunatic. So you kind of have to back the chart out a little bit and not get caught up in the zigs and zags. And again, like I said a second ago, you want to put some alarms in there to let you know what's going on. Now, the other thing that I've done lately, and I'm kind of proud of myself, and believe me, I screw up a lot, but one thing that I've done lately is I've stayed out of narrow range bars for many, many days just by waiting for that bar to expand quite a bit. It doesn't always work out like uh, J Nug the other day, I think it was J Nug, just went up and up and up and up and up, and it never really did set up. But once I saw that its range was actually bigger than prior day's ranges, I knew that a big day range was developing, but it just, by the time it finally set up, it just wasn't enough and I ended up scratching out a small loss on that. Do you try to time positions off the price action S&P? No. So what George is asking is, do I take a look at the spiders and say, okay, I like this stock, it looks pretty good, but the spiders are kind of weak today but my setup is triggering, what do I do? I, I, I think it's it's too much. You've complicated things too much when you do that. If you like your daily setup and you're trading the core methodology, and if, time, if we have time, 
maybe I, we can go in and look at some of our winners lately and we could look at what the market was doing on those days okay when they triggered in and let's just see what happened okay but yeah too much you're trying to figure out too much george and and that's good it's you, you know you got to noodle with everything but then you got to decide on whether or not it's just going to make your life more miserable all right real quick if you are not if you're a member that is and you have to be a gold member at least of davelander.com to participate and that's to keep the riffraff out boy i tell you conversations have been fantastic there maybe me and mike p can take up our we can debate on where the s p is going to head today this webinar is over but you can interact with other traders and ask for help to my surprise a lot of you guys i want to thank you for it i owe you a beer a lot of times you guys will jump in and answer a question before i have time to answer it and you'll see things like the signs and signals as they occur and occasionally i'll throw out opening gap reversals you know, like this morning i mentioned that hey look i don't know which way this market's headed but i think it's going to either be a gap and go or an opening gap reversal so i have orders on both sides so if you're interested in becoming a member you can go to davelander.com members or if you want a lot more information go to that big old long url above it all right let's go to live charts and while we're shifting gears just give me about one minute to get to the live charts. You could ask about anything else that I haven't covered just yet. And then also start thinking about your favorite stock picks and just start punching those in now. We'll take a look at what's happening in the overall market. We'll look at some sectors and then maybe we could take a look at a couple of stocks in the open portfolio and what they've done or have not done. And as George said, let's let's see what they did relative to the, the spiders. So let me see if I can get this shared. Mike's got me watching the screen. <laughs> I had a friend of mine, his father was Yugoslavian and he was 15 years, his dad was always like, the kid was a badass. He's, he's probably in prison right now. <laughs> kid was always in trouble. One day the kid comes to my house and he's like, uh, I mean, that was a kid too at the time. He's like 16, I'm a 16 or whatever. He's like, man, I, uh, this 18 wheeler, squeezed me into the side of the bridge look at my car and it's like oh my god god did you get its license plate number? no it's kind of freaked out and everything and and then i was like wow i said i can't believe that guy did that <laughs> and so he starts laughing he's, i was like what he said okay i just wanted to see if it would work before i went home and told my parents <laughs> uh anyway <laughs> long story endless his dad would always say damn you damn mule and then he was 15 or 16 years old when he realized his father was saying not damn mule but damn you <laughs> so so mike peterson damn mule that was a long run for a short slide wasn't it all right let's take a look at the peas let's take a look at spiders so we had a little bit of an opening gap reversal and so far initially i was getting paid or i hadn't got paid because it didn't hit the profit target so what happened was one thing i didn't like about this market on the open was it just kind of drifted higher to me it looked like a market that was faking out so i made sure i had my stop way 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 up here okay and we did have a nice little opening gap reversal after beginning the breakdown but now we're kind of grinding around in here trying to work our way a little bit higher and then hopefully mike doesn't trigger in because that means that i just lost money on the trade now getting back to the S and P 500, let's let's take a look at that little five three. What kind of fascinated me with this is it makes a lot of squeezes into the five thirteen. I'm sorry, makes a lot of squeezes into the thirteen, but a lot of time it times it recovers. And then again, I think you can use the angle of attack, like Dakota said. That that's that's probably as good as anything. Uh, notice the angle of attack of the five into the thirty. And that's the other thing I was looking at too this morning. And I learned a lot through teaching. And I think that somebody once said, you want to learn something, teach it, right? But you could probably use the five and the 13 by themselves, right? Okay. And that could be your timing. Hey, let's let's buy when we have a squeeze into the th into the 30. I'm I'm learning as we're talking, right? Look at that. You went long here, and then if you have a crossing, then you want to get out. Okay. So you had a crossing back here. So far, we had a little squeeze into 30. It looked kind of scary, but what happened? The market went back up. Okay. So I'm I'm pretty pretty bullish still. Like if you had to label me one thing or the other, I'm just bearish intraday. <laughs> I'm bearish until I get stopped out. My Cajun just slipped out. I'm bearish. 
So let's take a look at the bow ties. You can see we're still in uptrend proper order for now. We're also trying to peep out of this little range in here. That as long as my initial profit target gets hit in the futures and I get stopped out of scratch, I don't care if it goes up all afternoon. In fact, that's what I'm kind of hoping because I am long, very, very, very long. Look at the NASDAQ. I feel like tiny Elvis. Look at that NASDAQ, it's huge. Gapping up here to all time highs, 1% higher today. Not gonna argue with that. Okay, stalling out a little bit intraday, but let's not forget about the forest by looking at the trees, if I said that right. You can see still pretty much uptrend proper order in the Rusty, but the Rusty has been lagging quite a bit. Let's take a look at gold before I forget. Gold is nearing new highs in here, so so far so good in gold. I am long NGD from the recent Landry list, a little cheapy, okay? Let's just see what it's doing today, see if I need to drop an F-bomb. Nah, it's off a penny. Not enough to, not enough to ruin my weekend, right? Now what's kind of interesting in here in here is the old momentum is becoming new momentum again. Notice drugs are right here at all time highs. Take a look at biotech. Bam, winning, look at that. <laughs> look at that, look at that biotech, it's huge. <laughs> it's like one person's like, I laugh every time you do Tiny Elvis. Everybody's like, what the hell is, everybody else, what the hell is Tiny Elvis? Retail stocks, winning, look at that. Bam, brand new all time highs. So far so good there. Look at the proper order of these moving averages. Been that way for a long, long time, okay? If all you did was stay on the same side as the proper order of the moving averages, yes, you'd get chopped up here and there. But for the most part, you would capture some nice trends and be on the right of some nice trends. Now, you could also insert that five-day, 13-day if you wanted to do that, or you could do the Landry light, or insert your favorite trend indicator and just follow along. And after a while, they all kind of look the same and all kind of act the same. A few weeks ago, somebody said, what about a 40-40 EMA as opposed to a 30 or whatever? And we did the same sort of analysis, and guess what? It all kind of played off. What setup is Mike playing in S&P? You playing, a, Mike, what are you playing? A five-minute cup and handle? Okay. Gotcha. All right. Well, good for Mike. Well, hopefully bad for Mike. <laughs> Unless it triggers. It's good for Mike as long as it doesn't trigger. All right, so for the most part, the market looking pretty good. Uh, one thing that's oh, by accident just put on a bulk shipping. This this is an ETF, but it looks like it's doing pretty good today for what it's worth. The dry shippers. The one thing that's kind of been interesting, and for a little while, it looks like the old momentum, such as biotech and retail and some other areas, were hanging in there. And then new momentum was emerging, such as the energies. Unfortunately. As you can see, they've begun to lag a little bit in here, okay? Not the end of the world, but certainly lagging. And the old momentum has begun to take off again. So kind of interesting there. One more thing before I forget, the gold stocks are finally beginning to wake up again in here. They look like they were kind of rolling over in spite of gold being at new highs or near new highs. But then now beginning to rally in here. All right. All right, lots. Let's take a look at these individuals. John wants to know about why M A B. Uh, looks pretty good, John. Yeah, it could use a little bit more pullback. It's a little bit on the thin side, not incredibly too thin. But yeah, certainly in a trend, and certainly as pullback. I'd actually like a little bit more pullback, but I'm gonna, I'm almost, I'm almost at high five on this one. Okay, not quite. I guess I can't high five anymore with Corona, can I? KC for Zach. KC, are you long? You're long KC, I think. That's why you're asking. Yeah, I wanted to congratulate you on this one a couple days ago. It, it really didn't have enough pullback for my taste, but in these IPOs, sometimes we play what? New closing highs, which would have been on this day here, okay? Sometimes we play new closing highs with the five day moving average, which we'll put in here. And a simple base is five day simple. Okay. So that would have been Landry light here, new closing high here. So that would have been an entry. So I guess I shouldn't get too picky on not a deep enough pullback. But yeah, it looks pretty good. Have you taken partial profits yet, yet on that? Or I don't know if you've got enough out of it yet. But yeah, it looks good, but it's not set up right now. Two stocks, SPRT. You bought it with the stop. Okay, this is a cheapy. Okay, two two problems initially jump out at me. 
Number one, it's a cheapie. Not that I won't go after cheap stocks, you know, but Dave, you just bought that NGD, it's a dollar 32. Okay, all right. Sometimes I go after cheap stocks, but let's take a look at the NGD real quick. All right, NGD, mother of all rallies, nice deep pullback, okay? Big Dave, that's what Big Dave likes to trade. That's a good looking Big Dave chart, okay? When in doubt, take the chart out. What do you got? It's thrust followed by pullback, okay? All right, but Dave, it's a cheap stock. What about cheap stocks? Well, look at the volume on here. You add a couple of zeros to that. It's 93 million. I know it's only a dollar change, but it's 93 million shares a day. That's enough volume to trade. Okay. So this is really, 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 really thin. Okay. Now you've got a big old fat gap here, and you can see the stock kind of trades in chunks. It's electric cardiogram. It takes off and implodes. It's a Jackie make it makes the stock. It's down. It's up. It's up. It's down. It's up. It's down. Okay. So I would leave that one alone, but I, I hear you. It's kind of taken off and pulled back, but it's also pulled back into its prior breakout, which is in this big old fat gap. Now, you're already long. No, if you haven't taken it, then don't. Also, I'm long in STG, okay? Now, I don't see any of my patterns here, but on 6.9 on a breakout. Okay, well, I'm not a breakout guy unless I'm trading IPOs which is a few breakout patterns I trade there. So six, nine, let's see what day that is. Six, nine, six, 19. Okay, I hear what you're saying. It broke out, but then unfortunately it was a fake out. It closed poorly. It kind of reminds me of, of, uh, of, of Darvis, like a Darvis box. If you guys, you guys in here, most everybody's in here in the Facebook group. We've been talking about Darvis lately. Yeah, I just don't see anything to excite me here, but it is beginning to break out again. So maybe you'll you'll be vindicated. Just have a stop either, you know, ideally below the base, just because that way you know you're really wrong, right? Or maybe in the middle of the base and then wait for a better setup again, okay? But yeah, I would not have bought this initially because there's no pattern for me there. Now, keep in mind that that... I won't catch every move in every stock. If I did, you'd never see my fat ass again. But the point I'm trying to make is my methodology is not to be all end all. Sometimes stocks just take off, okay, without me. KLPN, I like. I think I'm either long or recommended that as a long. KLPN. Let me see if I'm long so I can full disclose. Yes, I'm, I'm long. I'm long KLPN. It is the most incredible stock I've ever seen in my life. What I would highly recommend you do is mortgage your house, borrow some money from your uncle and put everything you own, sell all your assets and buy as much stock as you can afford. You know, obviously I'm just being stupid here. But yeah, I like the stock, a little bit more speculative issue, obviously, okay? Some of the things I talk about not doing, so I'm breaking some rules here, but it's got plenty of volume and it's had, had a pretty nice run. Doesn't have a whole lot of overhead supply until two and then three. And you know what, if it goes to three, you might not see my fat ass again, right? <laughs> yeah, as a new position, I'm not that excited about it because it's already kind of started breaking out. But but yeah, good good eye on that, Chris. High five, huh? AWH, AWH. Um, I don't like this big, fat, ugly bar here and this other wide range bar here. You know, other than that, I hear you. HV, a little crazy, 139. Oh, we've got to look at the S&P. Yeah, I mean, this thing is just, this is what I call a bottle rock, and a stock that just goes straight up like this, it's going to be very hard for it to sustain that. So uh, I'd be really careful with that one, and, and it's just kind of all over the place. But that's crazy, Stuart. Yeah, it really is. What's its what's his name? Tracy Morgan. That's crazy. B&R, yeah, B&R looks interesting. A uh, little bit on the thin side, only 100,000 shares. I've been watching this one. It's in my IPO list. Sometimes you get that first deep retracement. It goes a little bit against the core methodology. Sometimes these IPOs just blast higher. They get ahead of themselves, and they come right back in. But then they can make that next leg out. So I do like this one. Check the spread on it, okay, before you go after it. As you know, John, we talk about the Hotel California stocks. In fact, who was it that brought that up? It was either you or the other John, John Z maybe, brought up Hotel California stocks. So it could be that. How about I know long, nice bow tie, 20 EMA, 21 EMA today. I know. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how people put little tweaks on bow ties and stuff. And it sounds like you've got a little 21 day in there. 
sneaky. Yeah, this is just so volatile. It's so crazy. And part of the, uh, what's a good word? Part of the fear, FOMO of being left behind with some of these wild and crazy stocks. I've actually watched a few of them intraday. I think it was uh, not 1M, but I traded 1M the other day and actually did pretty good. And I don't want to get sucked into that every day. But some of these crazy stocks, like I know, I've actually kind of kept an eye on to see if there's some sort of patterns, bow ties and 5, 5 13 and 30 EMA squeezes and stuff like that to play. Uh, on a daily chart, it's just it's it's actually too crazy, even by big Dave standards. Okay. But I hear you, man. This thing blasted higher and pulled back. I certainly can't fault you in that. But it's just a little too crazy. And I've also been kind of noodling. I think it was, and again, my apologies, was it John Z or John R talked about return to paradise. You get this these big thrust higher, followed by consolidation, and then another thrust higher. I'm kind of I hate to use the word hope, but I'm kind of hoping, I forget what issue it is. A it was a recent Landry list, APT maybe. I'm kind of hoping APT does that. I know I just used the word hope, but that's one that I'm actually long this particular stock. It's a little bit outside the methodology. So do as I say, not as I do. Why, why? Is that thank you or why, why? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's kind of interesting. It needs a little bit deeper pullback. Plenty, plenty volume. It's got some bad memories way back here. Let's not worry about that too much. Uh, it's accelerated higher. I like that. Okay. Yeah, it needs a little bit deeper pullback. And HV, a little crazy, but not too bad. Yeah, that's, that's not bad. <laughs> too late on coping. You mortgage the house on, for NGD. Yeah, was I talking about NGD last week? <laughs> I don't I don't want to be known as pump and dump. I'm, I'm obviously making jokes about the pump and dump guys. VRM. VRM, I like Dakota. Or was liking it. Maybe I'm going to confuse with something else. Um, yeah, it kind of needs a pullback. It's... Here, you I mean, technically, it did trick. Let's put the five day moving average in there. Let's see what's happening. We need a five day simple. So, technically, it did sort of trigger, I guess, on this day here at 50, it did trigger the. And I don't have a good name for it. Mike could give me a name and I forgot it. Uh, the IPO five, IPO thrust, or whatever we're going to call that, Landry Light IPO thing, technically would have triggered it. 50 and change. Um, it's, it's just had such a wide range bar higher and it's kind of all over the place. So for me to get excited, I have to see new highs, a trend, and then a pullback. Now, keep in mind with IPOs, there's pioneer setups and there's secondary setups. And if we take a look at like GAN, and I played both in this one. I failed miserably on one of them too, just truth be told. So again, let's see. On this day here, I bought in, okay, as a secondary setup, but it's still a pioneer setup at this point, okay? New closing high, low below the five SMA. Write that down. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. My initial trade was here, and I stopped out here somewhere. I'm not quite that low. Dropped a few f bombs at the end by the end of the day, but then you know what? Went back to the well. Go in and watch the show from a few weeks ago. We talk about that, but this would be like a pioneer setup back here because you're early in the trend. And then on the trading service, as you know, I added back shares. Sorry, added to my position. I forget which one or whether I stopped out or not, but I know I bought again when it began to take off again out of this pullback. So that would be a secondary position. So pioneer back here. I'm like the American pioneers. You either get gold or arrows in your back, and I've got both. <laughs> so that looks pretty good. So somebody was asking me earlier about. Like, how do you look at your positions with the S&P 500? So let's do this real quick. How do we do, I might not be able to do it. Let's see, comparison, we'll make a green and then we'll do a, we'll put the spiders underneath just for S and Gs. Okay. Now, of course you don't know to the end of the day doing this method, but just for S&Gs, let's see something. So now the S&P was up on that day. 
Yeah, it just so happens the S&P seemed to be up on the days that I bought. Let's take a look at, I am long QTT. I sold out of some this morning. It just looked like a bigger picture bottom to me. Let's see what happened. I don't remember. Okay, look at the S&P. The S&P is imploding here, but I triggered in. So the S&P was down, but I triggered in here, okay? And then what happened? Well, it doesn't always work this way, but had I not bought the stock because the S&P was headed the wrong direction, I would not have taken profits this morning and I would have dropped an F-bomb for not paying attention. APT, I like. Did we just talk about that one? I am long APT. Again, mortgage your house. Go knock on the neighbor's door and tell them about it. <laughs> It's a little unorthodox, but I do like the way it kind of took off in here and have it came back in. Now I'm a little a little premature and front running the setup on that one. Okay. So I, I have broken some rules. This is outside of the core methodology. I did this. I do follow the trades as mechanically as possible. And I do use a little discretion, as you know, but I do follow the service trades as mechanically as possible. So those stocks in the service. I am following those and I have bought those stocks that I recommended, okay? OCFT is one of them, for instance, and then it's hit the initial profit target and I'm still long this one and I don't remember the other ones, but there's a, quite a few others. Okay, John, you did the return to paradise. So John Ross gets credit for return to paradise. All right, so this trill, you know, if this stock begins to implode, I'm going to have to say the trill is gone. <laughs> I laugh at myself. The only thing I don't like, George, is that it really didn't get past this prior little peak in here. So I would pass. Biotechnology is, is doing so well lately. I would jump into biotechnology and see if you could find some other stocks. I'm nearly out of time, so not enough time to do it today. But scroll through your biotech stocks and see if there's anything you like. All right. One last, we got time for one last one, PLRX. Yeah, I like this one. And I've been watching this one. The only problem with this one is, look at the volume on that, okay? There's a few of these IPOs I've been watching lately. They look fantastic. But you gotta watch about the, uh, who was it? John, did you, did you also come up with Hotel California? Was that John Z? So we got Johns and Chris's in the group and a mic or two. But yeah, on more, a little bit more pullback, maybe. I mean, you know, with IPOs, sometimes when they take off like this, you don't get enough pullback to really make it like a core setup. But I think it looks okay. But just be darn careful. You know, maybe above this knockout bar, stop below the knockout bar, but look at the volume. And then I'd like to see what the actual spread is on it. Okay, we'll just squeeze one more in. This is one I've been watching for a while. I think I took it off the Landry list because it had so many days in the pullback. But I hear you. If you're long, it looks pretty damn good. I mean, volatile is all heck, right? HV about 100. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Oh, thanks for the, all the well wishes for the weekend. Everybody enjoy your long holiday weekend. Looks like me and Mike P will be here tomorrow trading S&P futures. <laughs> Maybe I'll take his trades and he'll take mine. At least we'll have a little liquidity out there. If we don't talk between now and then, again, everybody have a wonderful 4th of July. Stay safe, stay sane, and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.